<laughs> Greetings. So good to see you today. Uh, Wednesday, the 17th of August. All right, just making sure that you, you know, that you remember. Uh, it, <laughs> it's a day the Lord has uh, made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Uh, we're continuing uh, on this series, Making It Make Faith Sense. Uh, uh, and today our passage for review is Exodus chapter one. Exodus chapter one, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter one is our text. Let's ask God uh, to breathe on us with the Holy Spirit and give us illumination of the word. Eternal God, the Father, we love and adore you. Now that we have assembled as disciples, students of scripture, breathe on us the breath of life and break unto us the bread of life, the word of God. Make plain and real that which we study so we might be faithful witnesses of your love and your light in the world. Through Jesus Christ the Lord we pray, amen. Come on, let the church say amen. Amen, amen. amen. Um, so by now you, you have a sense that my approach to scripture is not simply for its spiritual interpretation, right? Um, that I, I approach it with its historical and its cultural significance in mind, uh, as well as with, with its political implications under and over tones, because that is the book. It is a book of history and law and culture and geopolitics and ethics and morality that help us come to an understanding of this God-human relationship. The love of God as it has been revealed to us through the ages in the perfect manifestation of Jesus Christ given to us in the church age that we might be faithful stewards of it until the time that the Lord either promotes us from the church militant unto the church triumphant or the Lord decides to consummate the age by breaking into it and letting New Jerusalem come down as a bride from heaven adorned for, for the bridegroom, right? And, and establish forever and ever and ever and ever and ever God's uncontested empire. Praise the Lord. That sounded good to me. <laughs> but today I, I want to talk about um, how, we, how we make faith sense of another issue in our culture. And I want you to really realize that what happens in the, in the, in the culture of America in many ways manifests itself in cultures of churches. All right, I want you to see this. I want you to, right? Um, and, and we've got to be able to discern and trace where those, though that kind of infiltration is happening so we are aware of it and we can respond to it. Amen? So today, I want to remind us this month, five years ago, Something happened. August 2017, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Far right extremists gathered for what they called a Unite the Right rally. 
For two days they were together and they clashed with counter protesters, leaving more than a dozen persons injured and several under arrest. Then shortly after 1 p.m. on the second day, a vehicle driven by one of the rally goers strikes a crowd of pedestrians in an attack that kills a 32-year-old woman and injures 19 others. White nationalists and far-right extremists marched through the University of Virginia's campus with torches. Dave Chappelle calls them the whites with the tiki torches. And they, uh, they encircle the base of the Thomas Jefferson statue. They engage in the violent actions of the day near the Emancipation Park in Charlottesville because the city council had agreed and voted to remove the statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Right. Now you remember what happened in response to that in Washington? Come on, talk to me. You, you remember what the man who was in the White House said? Come on. Yeah, you remember what he, what he said? How he talked about there being good people on both sides, right? Both good people on both sides, yeah. And then how he had to, his staff made him try to walk it back, but he really couldn't walk it back because he really had said what he had really felt, right? And it really begs the question, what is driving this madness? What's driving it? Because Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017 was not an isolated event. It's not disconnected from other things that are going on, not just in the culture, but in the political sphere. It's coordinated. It is a part of a larger attempt to return the nation to a time when in their minds, the nation was great. Then in 2020, we get in Essence Magazine, an article under the title, Preparing for the Browning of America. This was in October of 2020, and the statistics had revealed that for the first time in the nation's history, the majority of babies born in America were children of color. And this is important. We're going to get the Exodus 1. I just I want to lay the foundation for you so when we take off, you could see it. All right? So you had, in 2020, the majority of babies being born in America were children of color. Anyone who had studied demographic trends saw it coming for a while. But for the first time, the majority of babies under one year old were kids of color, and in many states, that change had already happened. In 12 states and the District of Columbia, the majority of children under the age of five are children of color. 12 states, including DC. The majority of children under five are children of color. But why should we even care about this? Now, there, there are a couple of reasons why we should care about this, at least. It's because this demographic reality is going to have a broad impact on everything that matters to us. Everything from education to health care to politics and to culture. 
right? Right? It's going to matter. And, beloved, it's going to matter even for churches. Right? But some on the right were already decrying the browning of the kids. After the statistics were released, one of those groups said, listen, this is important. They said, the United States of America is being transformed by immigrants who do not share American values and who have high rates of illiteracy, illegitimacy, and gang crime, and they will vote Democrat when the Democrats promise them more food stamps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, now listen, you, gotta, you have to see how this thing converges. There is anti-immigrant sentiment. There is anti-black sentiment. Uh-huh. There is anti-Semitic sentiment, all converging together to advance an agenda of what? Did someone say it? Say it, man. Say it like you mean it. That's right. See, you can't cast out demons you can't name. You have to be able to name it. Now think about that. Think about particularly the quote around American values. Write that down, American values. And then ask yourself, what are American values? What are American values? Write that down on one page, but then you ought to all, all, right across from that, you ought to ask yourself, what are your values? Right? Because when we use these terms, American values, they come loaded with a lot of assumptions. Right? Is it, is it just a house in the suburbs? Right? Two and a half kids? Right? Two cars, a garage. What are American values? Because obviously, the claim is that the more children of color that are born, that they aren't sharing in those values. Now, now you're born here, your children are born here, you're American. How is it that the stories, now I, I wasn't born here, but I'm a naturalized citizen, right? I, right? I got grafted into it, right? How is it that our stories never factor in when people construe the whole concept of what it means to be American? Especially in a city like this, where so many of you donned the uniform of this nation. Huh? And enlisted into service to defend this nation. Even at a time when you were treated better overseas than when you came back to the domestic shores. Am I telling the truth? Even, even just recently, um, the, the, some of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, who had competed in, in one of the military competitions, I've been talking over six decades ago, won the competition, won it, but they hid the trophy for decades. Because they didn't want to recognize that they had won, that they were superior in their skill, right? When we, th when we think about it, right? So, so then, 
this, this notion of what American values are. And I want to, I want to, I want to put this notion against Exodus chapter one. Let's go to it. Exodus chapter one. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Verse six, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation, what, died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. You see what's happening? Right? The descendants of Jacob, they just took off. All right? They prospered numerically in that land to the point that the land was just full of them. Right? <laughs> what, what, re remember that nasty racist term that folks were using about the children of, of folks coming through Mexico, what they called them, anchor babies? Yeah, that's what they're talking about here, that racist trope. The Israelites multiplying in Egypt, filling the land. Then verse eight, then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Ooh. Do y'all hear it? Y'all hear it? What did the last census reveal? That the majority of children born in this nation are what? Yeah, children of color. And so the Pharaoh says, look, <laughs> look, yeah, look, look folks. They've become too numerous for us all. Come, let, uh, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. My, 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 my. Now, what this Pharaoh is concerned about is if they, if they fight with the enemies and leave the country, they won't have the kind of labor class for the work that needs to be done. They won't have the kind of labor class. Okay? Now, didn't y'all hear folks say, if you don't like this country, <laughs> you should what? Go back. Go back. Go back. Now, where were you born? Here in America. In Alabama? Yes. Where were you born? Alabama. Where were you born? Alabama. Where were you born? Where were you born? Where were you born? Where were you born? Huh? So you, 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 you mean go back where? Here! And you know what, what is utterly silly about it? You have European Americans telling folks for whom the nation took territory in New Mexico and telling them go back from where they come. 
That's how ignorance is. It's proud, but it's proud in its ignorance. It's proud. And so they say they might fight against us and leave the country, we'll lose the labor. But for the others, they're saying, um, you kind of need to stay in your place or go back. Anyone in here born outside the country other than me in here? <laughs> oh, yes. So they might say the three of us, go back to where you come. <laughs> but it's grounded. It's grounded in that, that haughty ignorance that truth cannot support. So, it's, it's, it's what you call the dread of insignificance. It's the dread of insignificance. Um, then verse 11, so they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they bid uh, uh, Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Even if we go back to the Virginia, the, the early colonies, how, how ethnicities became strata, how they became layered for, for the success of colonies and who they decided they would make the domestic class. And whose pigmentation of skin they would start to vilify and demonize and dehumanize to the point that, that, that we in their minds became beasts of burden. Even to this day, it's still in the body politic of American life, uh, particularly among, among black women when they're giving birth, when their pain is not taken seriously by nurses, because ingrained in them is the assumption that black women could take anything. And how, how the, the morbidity of black women when they are delivering children is much higher than other ethnicities based upon the racist assumption that as a black woman, you could take everything. Why? Because the nation has put on the backs of black women everything and made the assumption that you have no breaking point. And we live out of that, even to this day. And it's a narrative, unfortunately, that some black women have internalized themselves. That they don't care for their own health because they're caring for their families. And then they take that stress on into their bodies and heart issues and hypertension and stuff like that become diseases passed from generation to generation because they see themselves as having to take the sufferings of everybody else. That's not what God intended. It's not what God intended. It's not what God intended. It's not what God intended. And I want you to know, sisters, I see it. I see you having to handle professional life and home life. I see you. Yeah, right? Um, but this dread of insignificance is important. 
it's the dread of insignificance. It says they, 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 they were exceedingly fruitful. They greatly multiplied. They increased in numbers. They filled the land. And, and then what it says toward the end, they began to dread the Israelites. Even as the census numbers show us that, that, that what they call minority ethnicities, and I don't understand how you could even make that a legitimate phrase because the majority people of color, um, or the majority people around the world are people of color. The majority population around the world are people of color. So how they get to be minorities? The term minority is this kind of dismissive term, doesn't speak of number, it speaks of power. Power. And it's not a new concept because you already see it in the text. One group says, we can't let them keep increasing because if they keep increasing, they are going to mess with our bottom line. Money, y'all. My economics is going to be messed up. And if you mess up my economics, my way of life will be disrupted. I need you to stay in your place. Stay in your lane and do what has been prescribed for you to do based upon your caste system. But if you tried, now, now we might let a couple of you rise out of it. Listen to the, listen beloved to the rhetoric the man said about the sister Brittany Griner in Russia. He said he ain't cared about her because she done made a lot of money. That is what their concern is. That's how you get a Herschel Walker running in Georgia. Not because he's smart, but because he fits their bill. He's a sports icon who's got some money, who cozied up to them. But when he comes to policies, he has none. He doesn't understand the issues. That's what they want, blacks to entertain. Amen. Right? Now, I, <laughs> sometimes, I, I, sometimes I think, man, do I really go hard on these issues? But, but the truth is, I, I watch a lot of these conventions over the summer, holy convocations and gatherings of religious folk, and everybody having a good time. And I ain't hear nobody talk about voting rights. I don't tell them, nobody talking about these issues that affect us. So after you shout and you done sweated out your clothes, you still got to go out in this world and deal with the demon of white supremacy. Do you hear me? Am I, am I, am I making sense here? And, 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 and this dread, this dread, is pushing them to do some immoral things. Now, can I tell you something? Can I sit down a little bit? Can, can, I, can I tell you something? This ain't just happening in American life. This happens in churches too. Yes, it happens in churches too. These churches love saying, oh, listen, uh, open the doors of the church. Open the doors of the church. But think about what that means. What it means to open the doors of the church means that you give an invitation to people to come and become a part of the movement of Jesus Christ in this local place. But you can't tell them, come be a part of the movement of Jesus Christ in this local assembly, but just don't say nothing. You can't join the choir. You can't usher. You can't have leadership till you've been here 40 years. A amen? A amen, lights? Amen. Do you see what I'm saying? 
What happens, is, what happens within the human being when you feel that your space is being threatened? When you feel like you're being displaced, I, I, <laughs> it's all over your face. I see it. Come on, y'all, talk to me. Don't act like I'm, yeah. We, we, we get to fighting. We get to defending and holding our position because no, you can't replace. But I, I, want you to, I want you to hear what this is all about. Um, th there's a little fella on Fox News, uh, Freddie Haynes calls him Lil Tuck Tuck. Okay, his name is Tucker Carlson. Okay, um, and Lil Tuck Tuck has been espousing what he calls the great replacement theory. Okay, that's what Lil Tuck Tuck's been talking about for a long time. Let me tell you what the Great Replacement Theory is. Um, the Great Replacement Theory says that any kind of welcoming policy impacting non-white immigrants are a part of a design to undermine or replace the political power and culture of white people living in Western countries. Yeah, that's what it is. So you're having gone to school to be educated. You're being good at your job. You're meriting the promotion you received. Despite all the ways you got there legitimately, is chalked up to affirmative action. Which, by the way, is before the United States Supreme Court. Yeah. Anytime you show up in those spaces knowing your stuff, folks with less experience, less credentials, will always look at you as though you didn't get there on your own merit. Yeah. And it, it, it plays into their minds that you're replacing them. And there are multiple iterations of this. Let me give you a couple. Um, one is, is what we call the, in, the rhetoric of invasion. And we use this about immigrants, that we got to stop them before they conquer white America. So remember the last time the, the whole notion was, there's a caravan coming through Mexico toward the southern border. Ah! And they freaked out. Right? Even when the numbers showed that the border crossings were at its lowest, they still freaked out. And then they started with this, oh, ISIS is coming through the southern border. Now, beloved, white men have perpetrated more mass casualties in this nation than ISIS has but they ain't gonna tell that truth because it doesn't fit the narrative. Then there is voter replacement. If they keep coming and having babies, automatically they gonna vote Democrat. Now, re read the stats. Hispanic and Latino voters trend more conservatively. Yeah. The Cuban population in South Florida, they trend more conservatively. That's how Mr. Trump won Florida in the last presidential election. And Texas, 
they trend more conservatively. So that whole assumption is flat out wrong. And if you would actually give someone a great vision to vote for, you could have more than just white voters in your party. And I say this not just to the Republicans, I say it to the Democrats too. Stop pandering to folks. Present a great vision for how we move forward together. Because I believe America still has the greatest opportunity to show the world what it is like to have a multi-ethnic democracy. A hope that no matter where you were born, if by hard work and ingenuity, you would apply yourself, yes, you could make it great. But not great in the sense that you have to, to step on people to get there, but great in the sense that you could fulfill your God-given potential without people trying to hinder you. And that's what we want. That's what you want for your children and grandchildren. That they would be able to live and grow and play and find their way in life without having to deal with the nonsense that's thrown in their way. Then there's also the anti-Semitism. Now, these play out in very real ways. So these are not just, you know, heady concepts. These play out in very real ways. And I want you to see how in Exodus chapter 1, the Pharaoh says to the Egyptians, like the folks are saying today what they're going to do. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them. We, what do they say? We must. Come on. How? Shrewdly. Shrewdly. What, what, what does that mean? Uh huh. Yeah, right? We're going to deal shrewdly with them, cunningly. By crafty means. And that's exactly what's happening. They're dealing shrewdly with us. Um, you had the August 17 gathering. Then you had October 2018. 11 congregants killed in a Pittsburgh synagogue in one of the deadliest attacks against the Jewish community in the, in the nation. And the shooter believed and espoused in the great replacement theory. Then March 15, 2019, 51 folks killed in attacks in, a, in mosques in Christ Church, New Zealand. Again, the shooters manifesto repeatedly and directly reference replacement theory. August 3rd, 2019, 23 people killed in mass shooting in a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. The terrorists targeted Latino shoppers and his manifesto referenced what? The great replacement theory. In Buffalo, New York, The, sh the shooter was motivated by preventing black people from eliminating the white race. What's that? The great replacement theory.
even here in Madison County over the last few weeks. Law enforcement agencies in this county set around the image of a man who, while being held in custody, says if and when released, he is going to target black churches. The great replacement theory. That's why we're standing up this security ministry. We ain't taking anything for granted. But the thing about it is, you don't even know where or when these crazies are going to strike. It's in the body politic. It's just oozing through. Through and through. Through and through. Not only is it happening in these violent manifestations, it's happening in its shrewdest forms in legislative bodies across the country. This year, state lawmakers have focused on enacting election interference legislation with six states already passing nine laws that threaten to undermine voters' confidence in the security of elections. The same lawmakers who spent 2021 passing laws that made it harder to vote have focused more intently on election interference, passing nine laws that could lead to tampering with how elections are run and how results are determined. Yo, this ain't no time to play. Election interference laws do two things. One, they open the door to partisan interference in elections. And two, they threaten the people and processes that make elections work. Did y'all see those two sisters who were election workers in Georgia who testified before the January 6th committee? The sister who said, I don't even like giving my name in public for fear that someone and the others who showed up to the, to, the, to the folks' house up there in Pennsylvania. And then, you know, what, what sickens me the most is, is how folks try to gaslight us into thinking this ain't an issue. Yes, this is an issue. And because we point it out as an issue, then we become the problem. Between January 1 and May 4 this year, six state legislatures, Alabama, Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, and Oklahoma have passed nine election interference laws. Which means, if, if you're successful staying on the voters' roll, and you show up to vote, and you vote correctly that they don't spoil the ballot, they still have a way of trying to nullify your vote through the state legislature. As of May 4, at least 34 bills with restrictive provisions were moving through 11 state legislatures. Overall, lawmakers in 39 states have considered at least 393 restrictive bills for the 2022 legislative session.
This ain't a problem. Both. No. It's the candidate for U.S. Senate in Arizona, the candidate for governor, candidate for secretary of state, candidate for attorney general, all on one party's nomination are all election interference candidates. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. We're at a critical time in this nation. Another reconstruction period. And I want you to appreciate how during the first reconstruction period we had elected black elected senators from the South. We had black elected represented senators, y'all, from the South. After the 10 to 12 years of reconstruction was upended, we wouldn't get the next black senator for almost 100 years, Brooks in, in Massachusetts. And then we got Carolyn Mosley Braun in Illinois, and then Obama. Can you see, can you see this? Every time there is success among people of color in this nation, there is a white backlash. And stop thinking that these are just the people who are carrying ticky torches. These are folks in white mainline Protestant churches. Because they're the old ones who voted for Mr. Trump. The good people, let's have Bible study together. But anytime you say justice, they, get, they cringe. They cringe. Because the truth is, Jesus is right. You cannot serve God and mammon. You've got to choose. And America wants God and mammon. Jesus was right. You can't have two masters. You got to love one and hate the other. You got to choose. This gospel calls us to make a decision and to not waver in that decision, but to be, be firm in it. I, I, listen, I believed it. I believe it then and I believe it now. This is the age when we got to call the Antichrist what it is. If it walks like the Antichrist, if it talks like it, you got to label it, you are not of God. Right? But Brother Richardson, speak up so they can hear you. Now I'm thinking, are we going to get along? I mean, that's the record. 
So you see, you see that back to Africa kind of rhetoric, right? How, how it, it, it ain't a new thing, right? You had William Edward Burkhard Du Bois saying at the turn of the, the 20th century, the color line is going to be the issue of this century that the nation has got to work out. Then you had AME preacher um, Reverdy C. Ransom, who was saying that American Christianity got to work out this race issue because it can't truly be Christianity if this race issue is its persistent social problem. You had Howard Washington Thurman in the 1930s saying the same thing. You had people rise up saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. We are now in the third decade of the 21st century and we still have not dealt with the issues of 1863. So I don't have time to dance to the tune of other folks. I take my directives from the gospel. Do you hear what I'm saying? And I'm not just talking about by and by pie in the sky. God has worked out my eternal destination, but he's also called me to occupy here. So we ain't just looking just to die to go to heaven. We are supposed to be living the abundant life here. And what that means, get your knee off our necks. That's what it means. And you can't, you can't equivocate in this. You can't say, please, sir, would you get your knee off my neck? No. Do you hear what I'm saying? <laughs> you you got to be you got to be as as militant as as, as uh, Charles Wayne Scruggs was back in the day, right? Because that's what it calls for. That's what it calls for, beloved. Um, and I know I know I know in these days. As you take these things to God in prayer, as you talk to your children, as you talk to your grandchildren, as they go out into the world, and I know you pray over them, and I know you anoint them as they're going back to schools and they're facing all these realities, you got to have these kinds of culturally competent series and studies with them. Help them see the pieces, bring it together, help them make sense of it. When they ask these questions, sit down and tell them the stories of your people. Life ain't been no crystal stair. Tell them. Arm the next generation with something powerful. But then also give to them, and I like to see this, and, I, and I'm encouraged to see younger generations who are more hopeful about what the future means because that's what this is. What happens here in Exodus 1, what's happening here in America, and yes, our congregation, is this tussle between the past and the future. Who we are becoming, what God is calling us to. We have no stewardship over the past, beloved, it's settled. What we have is a stewardship over the future by what we do today. And Paul says, forgetting that which is behind, I'm going to lean in. But he says, I'm going to press. He doesn't say walk. So the imagery of pressing means that there's got to be something that's providing some drag and some resistance. But I'm going to keep pressing. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on what? Higher ground. Lift me up. Let me stand. By faith 
on heaven's table land, a higher plane that I have found, Lord, plant my feet. Oh, praise his name. Praise his name. We got much work to do, beloved. We really do. But the grace of God will give us courage and conviction and strength to make it endure. Bless us, O oh God, as we go into the world to be your witnesses, to share your love, to shine your light. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Good to see you, Sister Lee.